Hello everyone, uh, this is a sacred cow tipper here. Um, this latest article I've written, uh, I thought I'd post on YouTube as a video. Alright, uh, here we go. It's called, Does the Bible Really Teach That the Earth is Flat? Okay, the reason why I am doing this video is because there have been many atheists and evolutionists on YouTube and they are constantly criticizing God's word and calling it a lie and they try to cite Isaiah 40 22 as a verse that shows the Bible teaches the earth is flat they cite the word circles being two-dimensional so therefore it's the Bible can't be accurate you can't trust it therefore there must be no God I mean that's that's usually the logic and reasoning <clears throat> behind uh, this whole thing of Isaiah 40, 22. It's one of the verses they bring up the most. And uh, I got 27 years of Bible study, uh, two years of it in college. But I've studied uh, quite a bit along with the Strong's Exhaust of Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic Concordance. And so, therefore, I'm going to take that. I'm going to take common sense and... Everything else I could think of to explain this verse to you. Uh, I understand people got questions, but to just take a verse and say, oh, this proves the Bible isn't true, when there's actually no study time given to it, I have to question why you would use the verse in the first place. So here we go. So the, sph the sphericity of the earth is at question. Okay, the sphericity of the earth was accepted by all educated Greeks and Romans by 100 AD. And the book of Job goes way back beyond that time period by at least a thousand years and portrays a spherical earth that was hung on nothing. The word gravity had not been thought up till about 2,500 plus years later. But here we have a reference in scripture to it in the book of Job. Okay, there's all kinds of references in the Bible about things that seem to explain things but we have modern words for a lot of these things today and one of them is gravity okay and here's the verse job 26 7 he stretcheth out the north over the empty place and hangeth the earth upon nothing in other words the uh, earth is free floating okay job didn't have the word gravity back then so that's how he explained it Alright, so here we go. There are many biblical verses that talk about many things that modern science has taken hundreds and sometimes thousands of years to even notice. Modern science, real science, actually proves the Bible to be a supernaturally written book. It comes down to this. How could have the writers way back then have known this stuff unless they were truly inspired by an intelligence beyond our capabilities? Th think about that. They were limited in some areas of science. The electron microscope wasn't around yet, and cosmology was in its infancy as far as what we know today. Okay? Let's move on. <clears throat> if you've read any of my writings, I use some systematic theology, exegesis, some Greek and Hebrew breakdowns, along with some etymology research. Uh, but there's one thing I like to hold in my arsenal, and I'm going to coin the term now. Maybe someday it'll be an actual word in the dictionary. And I'm going to call it common sense exegesis. Okay, this wouldn't be biblical exegesis, but just common sense exegesis. That everybody should have common sense, and if they would think about it, expound on what they're thinking, uh, they would come to some very logical, reasonable conclusions. And so here we go. <clears throat> common sense exegesis is when you take your God-given common sense when looking at something, then expounding on it. That's all, that's all it is. So here we go. Let's go to the verse that most uh, people who are Bible illiterate that think they, because they read the Bible one time or read it out of context, uh, think they know what they're talking about. Let's, let's uh, go ahead and let's take the verse. They like to try to disprove the Bible's accuracy and the easily observable fact of creation. 
So here we go. Isaiah 40, 22 is a very is a verse many try to use to say the Bible teaches the earth is flat. So let's look at the structure of the verse and uh, a few other things. It is he, that's God, that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers, that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain, and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. Okay, that's Isaiah 40, 22. I will give the non-believer this. The word for circle in the Hebrew is chug. If I'm pronouncing it right, chug or kug. Uh, it could be spelled C-H-U-G or K-H-O-O-G. I think it's uh, pronounced K-H-O-O-G, Kug. Okay, and that is Hebrew in the Strong's Dictionary, Hebrew 23:28. Okay, now this word <clears throat> in the Hebrew could have been translated circle, circuit, or compassive. Okay, now the King James translators uh, chose to use the word circle. I think circle and circuit, either one of them could have been used. Compassive is so antiquated. Uh, when I did some etymology research on it, it, it didn't even make sense. Okay, as far as using that definition of the Hebrew word to fit in there. So King James rightfully used circle, but circuit would have been just as well used, and I will explain that in a little bit here. So my first common sense argument is circle doesn't necessarily have to mean a flat circle, but can also mean a sphere, as I will now show. A synonym for circle is sphere. So circle does not have to be rendered as two-dimensional, but can definitely be rendered as three-dimensional. My opponents cannot use that as their argument for this reason. The King James Version chose to use the word circle out of the three possible strongs, Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic dictionary definitions of this verse, which I just explained above. Okay, now the word circuit could have been used also without taking away from the context of the scripture, so let's look at that. And this would really point to three-dimensional, okay, a three-dimensional universe. The word circuit has some interesting synonyms like route, course, track, trail, path, trip, and tour. So this verse can also be rendered as such. God sits upon the path, trail, route, or course of the earth. And it could actually have been a more accurate rendition of the scripture verse and could have meant that God sits upon the earth's revolutionary path around the sun. There is no way to know that. The King James translators had to pick one of the Hebrew definitions that... Uh, fit the context, what they felt fit the context most closely, and they just happened when translating it into English, they chose circle. Okay, you got to remember the Hebrew original Koine Greek is inerrant uh, without any, you know, it's inerrant, it's accurate, and all that. When, when, when it gets translated into another modern language, English, uh, Latin, uh, Spanish, whatever. Uh, there could be some minor errors in the translation, or they could have took one of the definitions that might have been a little less accurate and used that. But it, nonetheless, uh, King James did not take away from the context when they used circle. Uh, the average person reading this who isn't skeptical right off the bat would have come to the conclusion that it's talking about a sphere and not a flat two-dimensional circle. As I stated at the beginning of this, uh, by 100 AD, the Romans and Greeks, they saw the shadows on the earth and all that kind of stuff. Uh, they, they considered the earth to be round. When the ships would go uh, off into a distance and disappear over the horizon, well, those ships came back to port. They, they knew the earth had to be round. So to say the Bible uh, stated this 500, 600 years uh, that it was flat was kind of nonsense. Because, I mean, there were boats even back then. So that, that's a very poor argument on the atheist or evolutionist's end. Okay, now we come to the word compassive. Compassive is a very antiquated English word that was derived from classical Latin. I couldn't even bring it up in the Merriam-Webster's online dictionary, and they even said, uh, you stumped us. <laughs> so this is a very antiquated uh, word, 
the word com and passive, uh, two root words put together. But anyhow, so it being that antiquated is probably why King James, the King James translators didn't even use that uh, or consider that as a definition of the three definitions in the actual Hebrew. Okay. So let's just not even bother with that one. That's not, that wouldn't work for either side's argument. My second common sense argument deals with how the scripture verse is written. Something to remember is that the book of Isaiah is written in prose and poetic form. Okay, and I guarantee you every, every debate I've watched, uh, the uh, atheist or evolutionist professor, when he starts to try to bash the Bible because he's losing the debates, they always bring up a verse and it's out of context or they, they don't know anything about the book that they're taking the verse from. The book of Isaiah is written in prose and poetic form, so there will be a lot of figurative language, metaphors, analogies, etc. within the chapters of this book. Now, that doesn't take away from the prophetic nature of the book. I'm not trying to say that, but it is written in prose and poetic form. Isaiah is even called by many the Shakespeare of the Bible by, by many theologians. That's... Isaiah can be considered the Shakespeare of the Bible. Okay, so taking that in light, so what is a metaphor? Well, it's a figure of speech in which an expression is used to refer to something that does not literally denote in order to suggest a similarity, or it is the expression of an understanding of one concept in terms of another concept, where there is some similarity or correlation between the two. An example of a metaphor would be this. We use the phrase, a blanket of snow, to describe a snowfall that covers the ground evenly, as if the snow were a fabric. Okay, We all know snow is not a fabric, but uh, that's a very good metaphor. Okay, So it, it is a way to portray something to somebody, to explain to them by describing it in another way, basically. Figurative speech seems to paint a picture, hence the word figure for, uh, you know, figure of speech. So, hence the word figure. You know, you're painting a picture for somebody. You're giving them a word picture. And this word picture is for the listener to help them better understand what one is trying to teach them or explain to them. How does that saying go? A picture is worth a thousand words. Okay, so there's your figurative speech. An analogy is a comparison of certain similarities between things which are otherwise totally different. In education, teachers commonly use analogies to introduce something new to students. They compare the new material to something the students already know and understand. An example of an analogy would be a street light is like a star. Both provide light at night, both are overhead, and both serve no function in the daytime. Okay, two totally different things, but it explains a truth. Okay, so let's go back to the study on Isaiah 40:22. It is God that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are, are the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. First of all, Orthodox Jews and fundamentalist Bible-believing Christians know that God is a spirit and doesn't need to sit anywhere. So it is obvious that Isaiah wrote this poetically. This is figurative language and simply means that God is king over his creation and he owns it all, whether you want to believe that or not. This is very simple logic if you have read and studied the whole Bible in its context. Most Christians don't even study the Word of God in its context. Okay, they just surface read it. That's called isogesis. That's not exegesis. Okay, secondly, as we stated above, circle can also mean sphere, and circuit can also be used in this verse and still be in context with what Isaiah is saying. Knowing all this, let's now go on. There's actually a metaphor within a metaphor in this one verse. Notice the part that says the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers. 
Well, if you're going to take this verse literal, uh, it's silly because the inhabitants of the earth are not as grasshoppers. And what that means is from way up above the earth's atmosphere or as the earth travels its revolution around the sun, it the people on earth would look like little tiny grasshoppers. That's all it means. It's obviously a metaphor and is backed by four other sections of scripture. See, sometimes you need to research things before you make a comment on YouTube. Here we go. I know you're going to accuse me of that same thing. <laughs> Anyhow, some of, you, some of you are really nice and I enjoy talking with you, whether you're an atheist or evolutionist. Some of you are really rude. I I don't, I don't uh, put too much, in, too much time into you uh, when you're rude. But uh, I'm trying to not be rude. So forgive me if at times I, I get rude or a little cocky. I don't mean to. Okay, so there are four other sections of scripture that talk talk about the inhabitants thereof being as grasshoppers. One example is when the twelve spies of the children of Israel went out to spy out the land that flowed with milk and honey. That was Canaan. And when they came back, the ten spies, ten of the twelve spies said that the children of Israel were as grasshoppers, meaning small in stature, compared to the inhabitants of Canaan. Okay, so according to Numbers 13.33, Judges 6.5, Judges 7.12, Isaiah 40.22, and Jeremiah 46.23, grasshoppers just means small and innumerable amount, or both small and innumerable. Okay, it always means that in the five times it's in Scripture. So, along with Isaiah 40.22, there's four other passages that give the same meaning. Scripture always interprets Scripture. Okay, that's part of hermeneutics. Scripture always interprets Scripture. You just have to do a word study to find this out. Most people don't take the time to do that, so they come up with some weird false doctrines, even, even within the body of Christ. And that's part of why I've called uh, my thing the sacred cow tipper. I tip over sacred cows, things people hold dearly that are false, that have been proven wrong, whatever. I Not just an evolution, uh, but also uh, false doctrines within the body of Christ. Okay, so I pick on everybody. I, I'm no respect of persons. Okay, so you evolutionists and atheists out there that may hate me for no reason at all because I believe in creation because I believe in a worldwide flood I pick on everybody all right and you guys pick on me so it's a fair fair ball game here okay so the verse itself is a metaphor written poetically and it also includes another metaphor within it okay that's some pretty creative writing for a guy uh, 500 plus BC Okay, so my conclusion and analysis of the matter is this. So to say and use this Bible verse to say that the Bible teaches that the earth is flat just shows that one has not studied it out. Read the Bible as a whole, read this particular verse in its context, or the reader just chooses to remain in ignorance on the subject. From what I've seen, most people who say this are just parroting what they have heard from someone else and many times it is, it is a college professor who disdains the word of Almighty God. I've seen this in many debates, video debates, and when they're losing the debate, that's what they resort to. Okay, and I've watched over 20 creation versus evolution debates now. Every single time, this is what, they've, what they do. They resort to bashing the Bible because they're losing the debate. And they say the Bible's full of contradictions. And every single time they've done that, I've researched the verse that they've brought up, and they've either misinterpreted it every single time, or it has said something totally different, and they actually lied to the students that were at the debate. Now that bothers me when they sat there, uh, one guy, I think it was a college professor at Rutgers University, he said something that a verse was talking about temple prostitutes. And I looked it up, and it had absolutely nothing to do with temple prostitutes. My first thing was, what Bible version was he reading from? Or where did he get this information? 
because it had nothing to do that didn't even allude to it so because he lost the debate he uh, lied to the about a thousand students that were at the debate that day uh, to, to put doubt in them that God's word was trustworthy and what he said was totally off base so if you can't win the debate maybe you need to look at something and say something is seriously wrong with my teaching and my theory that's my final word on that uh, I welcome any comments on this uh, if you're just gonna bash something without researching it you know appreciate it if you don't leave a comment uh, I'm open to discussion on this the Bible does not teach that the earth is flat some of you guys will bring up uh, a couple verses that talk about the four winds or the four corners of the earth once again it's an analogy it's figurative speech to explain something okay so quit using things out of its context out of the way it was written um, I think you need to stick to evolution versus creation and we could debate that uh, humanely um, one of the I'm, I'm gonna do a challenge a, an actual video challenge one of one of my questions is, is this and I've asked one or two people this one already and it had to do with the Cambrian fossils that are on top of Mount Everest and mountains all over the world where you have clams mollusks and all that in the closed position if they're in the closed position uh, there's that means they were buried rapidly because when a clam or mollusk uh, dies the muscle relaxes and releases and it opens up uh, okay and uh, one one nice guy his name's Greg Roots uh, nice guy we, we talk now and now he probably thinks I'm an idiot <laughs> deep, deep down but anyhow he's been nice to me I think I've been nice to him uh, he said that the uh, <clears throat> it was because of the geological uplift you know I think I I think I used uh, Grand Canyon as an example but but anyhow he talked about a geological uplift well the Bible does say that the mountains arose so there's actual scripture that talks about uh, after the flood that then the mountains arose and I believe that had to do with the tectonic plates crashing into one another and the mountains were formed at that point that could explain Cambrian fossils on the tops of the mountains but here you got Cambrian fossils you know where did the other strata layers go if Cambrian fossils if the geological column is true which I don't believe it is I believe there's maybe some truth in some parts of the world of some of the layers being accurate but for all of them to be accurate I definitely don't believe that you can't find that anywhere on on the planet uh, creationists have researched this every bit as much as evolutionists uh, and I'm talking scientists on both ends not just uh, like myself I'm I'm not a scientist I'm an apologist creationist but there are many creationist scientists that have researched this stuff also their conclusion is different and they're looking at data both sides are looking at data I think it's a great debate and we need to learn off one another but anyhow how do you explain Cambrian fossils how do you explain them at the top you can't have your cake and eat it too uh, to say all of the layers of strata have that are missing well now you no longer have a geological column to use to date your fossils and the fossils dating the fossils by the rocks and the rocks by the fossils it's in your own literature that that's how they date things it's really not done by radiometric dating uh, known lava flows uh, a week old date uh, a lot of times 1.5 plus billion years old uh, so don't hide those facts but anyhow how do you explain you know that'll be another subject forget that one on this one just wanted to toss that out there because it's a video I plan on doing so my conclusion does the Bible really teach the earth is flat no it does not if you uh, have learned any of the science of biblical hermeneutics uh, it's how to interpret scripture and you have to understand a lot of things before you go into uh, trying to expound upon a verse and I did that here uh, I'm sure others have done a more thorough exegesis on Isaiah 40 22 some probably have done a 20 to 30 pager this was I think a seven pager five or seven pager 
but it is more than enough to show that I've researched it. And that's that. If you, feel, if you want to leave a comment, go right ahead. Uh, let's keep the debate clean. And uh, I have to say, to use Isaiah 40, 22, uh, as part of bashing the Bible or saying the Bible's full of contradictions, uh, you lose the debate there. I blew that out of the water. And uh, let's keep this clean. All right. Uh, I love you guys who who keep it clean, who are actually wanting a clean debate, and who are willing to discuss this in a godly manner, whether you believe in God or not. I thank you for that. Uh, those of you who are just going to say F this and F that, you know, go get a job. If you don't believe God exists, and if you're not, and if you're not open to debates, uh, you're wasting your time on YouTube. Go live it up, because your time is short. You're going to be worm food pretty soon. So, you know, if 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 you're atheist, agnostic, evolutionist, and you're and you're open to an open debate, I'm all for that, and I love talking to you. But those of you who want to get dirty and nasty. You know, I, I rather you just uh, stay off my videos and go find a job, go live it up. Uh, actually, do what you believe. Okay? All right. Thanks a lot. Bye bye.